So one of the things I will guarantee you this evening is that today is not going to be a very nice, okay, today is a nice day, it's always a nice day. But what I mean by that is that we're not going to massage our emotions. We're really, really going to go into the, the, the pragmatics of things. And um, one of the reasons why as believers, it appears that many people pray, um, but don't get the kind of results that is due. And we're really going to touch some hard places um, this evening. Holy Spirit, help us with that. Um, one of the things I mentioned in the group a couple of days ago is about we get into the place of the understanding of the revelation of the name Yahweh is about. And it's really almost, besides the line of Judah thinking, it's really like the next revelation for the season. And um, one of the people who engage with that revelation of God is obviously David, the king. And you would understand that um, Yahweh Saba, which is God of hosts, is not, doesn't just only have to do with warfare. Okay, so let me, it, Yahweh of hosts has to do with warfare, has to do with territories. One of the things we don't understand is that this, the only thing that the jurisdiction of Yahweh is about is just fighting. However, there is wealth in Yahweh is about. There is protection. There is a, a form of provision in Yahweh is about, and it's important for us to um, note these things. Um, we we cannot we cannot just begin to live our lives as though. One, we are unbelievers or we are not believers. One of the things about being a believer is you should have an understanding of times and seasons. What that means is that as a believer, if everything about your life catches you unaware, there is a problem. So, um, or you have, you have this high level of uncertainty about life and about things, you should be worried. So um, you're not sure whether you stay in the country or you should travel out. You're not sure the kind of job you should go for. You're not sure the kind of relationships you should be in. You're not sure the season God is calling you into at this season. You're not sure about um, how the, the, the gates of wealth you should engage in. You're not sure in the kind of life you're supposed to live, if this is your story, if this is your situation, there is a problem. And it's important for us to begin to touch those sores so that we really know where the problem is and then we can begin to backtrack on how to solve it. If we continue to live in that state of delusion where we are manufacturing hope and it's something that is quite um um, common with highly religious people. They remove the pragmatisms of life and they substitute it for gross religiosity. And so what that means is that imagine people are, I'm speaking in parables, imagine people are in a state of war and from the scrolls of destiny, from the scrolls of time, the season we're in, it's a season of contention and wars. And then someone says that be because they are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, they would confess the word that it's a season of peace, it's a season of tranquility. That is, that is stupidity. That is foolishness. Because the core thing of the life of a believer, which is one of the things we started this retreat with, is being in the center of the will of God. You cannot be outside the will of God for you and then be quoting scriptures. Scriptures rarely walk outside the will of God. So you can take up the Bible. You can read the Bible. You can pray the Bible. But if you are not doing it in the center of God's will and administration, you are a joker. And so it's important for us to come to terms with these realities now, um, one of the things I want to talk to us about today is on what I call measures and measurements, which is very key. We need to begin to see our lives beyond the fairy tales that 
a lot of people have painted what our life is supposed to be or what our journey is supposed to be. If we really want to follow through the path and the patterns of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you would get to realize that his life was not really a fairy tale. It was highly structured. It was um, traumatic, if I could use this, that, that term. Imagine he being betrayed, going to the cross, even if Jesus knew he was going to the cross. The process of going to the cross, the pain, the rigor, the shame, the helplessness that came with it was real. And so it's important for us to understand that as well. So you cannot say, oh, Jesus is almighty, he's God in flesh. And so he just went to the cross like, yes, I know I'm the director of this movie and things will just go according to plans. No. It was, it was a horrendous situation. He was beaten. He was pierced. He was killed. And there's nothing nice about such situations. One of the things that a lot of religious people always um, miss is that point of measures. And you need to understand the only and that's why it's, it's a fantasy that a lot of people who claim to be religious or Christians or believers, they live a, a life of fantasy. And that's why when certain things happen to them, that is not in the script of the fantasies they played in their head. They're like, oh God, why is God doing this? Why is God doing that? And, and a lot of them um, leave God. You know, we, we've had situations where a lot of people threaten God. <laughs> I'm sorry, I laugh. You know, like, God, if you don't do this, I will show you. Like, we actually think, we actually think that God is our friend. To bust our bubbles, God is nobody's friend. The Holy Spirit can be that part of the Godhead that is your friend. But God the one who sits on the throne is not your friend. There are protocols to, that even Jesus had to go through for him to be presented before God. And so it's not just like, oh, you have a friend that is the CEO of the company and so you, you can just go in to meet him with him anytime. That's not the protocols of God. And this is where the understanding of measures and measurements actually come in. You cannot, I have not seen it, I stand to be corrected anyway, but I have not seen it play out on this earth for someone to manifest God without passing the test of measures and measurements. Now, for some people, they usually do believe that their test of measures and measurement is how long they pray, how long they fast. Sometimes that can be it. But we also have to understand that these measures and measurements are a school of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveal really to you. So let me make you understand. No matter how much you love God, if you don't hit certain measures, there are some results that will not be prevalent in your life. If you have not, um, you know, the scripture says that when you lay your hands upon the sick, they will be healed, and all the promises of scriptures. Those promises are conditioned on measures and measurements. What that means is that if you do not have the measures or the measurement that enables that power to flow through you, nothing will happen. And sometimes, and it's, it's one of the things that is lacking in the church today, and, and that is power, demonstration of power. Jesus moved in power, raw power. And the reason he was able to do that was because of measures and measurements. The Bible records that every time Jesus was done with his day's activities, what would the guy do? He would separate himself, find a hidden spot, and begin to pray all night. Why? Why didn't he just say, I am that I am, I'm the son of God, I command power to come to me? It doesn't work like that. 
there are standards of measures and measurement. If you want to engage power to a certain level, there are measures and measurement. If you want to pray and headache should go, there are measures and measurement. If you want to pray that cancer should go, there are measures and measurement. If you want to pray that the dead should come to life, there are measures and measurement. If you want to pray and you want something um, like Joshua did, and he took away a day out of February and disrupted the, the, the times, it takes measure. And the reason why a lot of things are not happening in your life, the reason why a lot of things are not happening in my life is not because if Jesus comes today, we will not go to heaven. But it's because we lack the measure for dominion. The Hebrew word for dominion is radar. And the radar means that exercising authority, compelling authority and control over a space. That means that if you have dominion over a space, you control the economy, you control the core politics, you control religion and spirituality and what have you. And so it's important for us to begin to see things in a different light, in a new light. And that is, what is the measure that you know you have? What is your limit? Jesus told his disciples, he says that there is something that is coming. He called it power. He says you need to tarry in a place and go through a strict regimen. So go somewhere, <clears throat> assemble there, and wait for you to be endued with power. And then the disciples and apostles too, they're praying. You need to know there's not everybody that started the first day that's made it to the last day. Some people are like, like that's begin to set in that. Wait, this is Jesus, nothing's going to happen. I have wives, I have kids, I have a business that I need to go back to. And so I don't understand this Jesus thing. And they left. But the people who endures to the end. One of the things you need to understand about that part of scripture that says he who endures to the end, it is not just he who is patient. And say, so, okay, let me wait, I'll wait, oh, I'll wait till that time. That is not endurance. Endurance is staying in a posture, staying in a place as you begin to build something. You know, that's why the Bible says in Isaiah that those that wait on the Lord, their strength will be renewed. That means there will be a source of empowerment. There will be a, a charging. Let me put it that way. We can use that term. Like you have a phone. Do you know that? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Do you know that the waiting, the endurance that God is actually talking about, the scripture is actually talking about is this. When you have a phone that is, say, 20%, and you've already gotten that low battery, low battery sound. What do you do with that phone? You plug the phone into power. That act of the phone being charged is actually called waiting. But what a lot of us term as waiting is a phone that has low battery, but you are not charging it, but you are praying for the phone to to increase in charge. As silly as that seems, that is the framework many of us have lived our lives. And I'll give you a very embarrassing situation that happened to me. We are here so I can share it. I remember, and, and I think it's one of the things that triggered me into pragmatism. I remember a time I was still very young and I knew from a young age that I really loved God and I really wanted to be close with God. And so many of the times, um, I would, I remember the two people that were very instrumental to my spiritual life and growth were Don Wen and Dalin Zetch. Because I remember them in secondary school, I was still kind of young then, I stayed in Ibadan. 
I would go all the way, but I didn't know what was controlling me then. I would go all the way to Mokola Roundabout. There is a place there where they sell gospel musics. I'll go there, buy CDs, I'll take Dalin Zetch, I'll take Don Wen. Then I have almost all the songs of Don Wen and Dalin Zetch as well. And then I'll be at home, I'll just be listening, praising God, worshiping God and all of that. And I just started imbibing all of that worship atmosphere. <laughs> so I remember one day, I usually walk from school to my house because my house is not that far from school. So on my way, I, I was just singing, I was just singing, glorifying God, and I was feeling the presence of God. I was like, oh my God, I love God, I love you, Jesus. And so while I was singing, I was walking, sometimes I would be so raptured in that worship that I would shut my eyes, you know, you are, you are used to the area, you, you walk every time. So I would just shut my eyes, walk, I'll open my eyes again. I'll, so when I want to sing maybe a part of the chorus I loved, I'll close my eyes and sing. And that continued to happen. So when I was almost, I could see the gate of my house and I was going to the last lap. There was that part I was just singing and I just closed my eyes and I was walking and I was just glorifying God. The next thing I heard was... <laughs> And I opened my eyes and I found myself in the gutters. Thank God it was a dry gutter, but I fell into the gutter. And I asked a question, I was like, God, but you knew that I was singing worship to you. And my heart was really connected. I could feel your presence. Why would you let this happen? In a state of worship and, and rapture in God, and I almost felt the Holy Spirit made me realize that because you are worshiping God does not mean that you should close your eyes to certain realities around you. And this is where pragmatism um, comes to us. A lot of us are living our lives the way I lived my life then. So that if anything bad happens, you will say, oh, but God, why? I was doing this. I pay my tithes. I give offering in church. I attend church twice a week, during the week and on Sundays. I pray for three hours every day. I fast two times a week. And you are just putting down your spiritual CV before God as though that will impress him. You need to understand that in life, there are measures and their measurements. There are some things that if you don't do, no matter how much you love the Lord, you will not get. There's a wealth God has for you, but there are certain things you need to do beyond praying and fasting that allows you to touch that wealth. That is measures and measurements. And so we need to come to the place as believers when it comes to political control, when it comes to financial control, when it comes to economy control, it is folly to continue to do something every time and expect a different result. And this is where you really need to put your life upon the scale to measure if you are really pragmatic about the things of God or about the things of the Holy Spirit. I remember one of the things, um, experiences I had when I was quite young. Um, I, I wrote it in one of my first books, that's um, Unleashing the Kingdom of God's Power. The whole, I was, the Holy Spirit said something to me that shocked me. He said something that, is, and he said, if your time on earth is not done, don't die. That means you cannot put yourself in uncomfortable and precarious situations because you have a covenant over your head that you will not die. The covenant of God works best when you are in the will of God. That's something we need to understand. And so before you can move the move of God, you must find out that you are in the will of God. And it starts individually as a person. Then your family, check, is your family in the center of God's will? Is your nation 
in the center of God. You cannot demand of God to move over a nation that is not in the center of his will. When we compel God to move over something, God requires return on investment. And one of the things that shows return on investment is that that person, that state, that family, that country, that continent is in the center of God's will. You cannot live outside the center of God's will and pray for God to bless you with wealth because that would be a wasted investment because you are not in the center of God's will. And so how to be in the center of God's will is not by claiming it, is not by praying it. Once again, is by measures and measurements. Now, I wrote a couple of things down here. And these are hard questions you need to ask yourself when it comes to measures and measurements. Number one, the, no matter what you are praying to God for, no matter what you have prayed to God for concerning this retreat, you need to become real and then ask yourself these questions. The first question is, <clears throat> what do you have? What is that thing that you have that guarantees that you will get what you're asking for? One of the simpler things is faith is the simplest. You know, in, in physics, chemistry, we usually say that an atom used to be one of the smallest parts of an element. Now, the smallest thing you should have, the smallest substance you should have, for God to begin to see and to entertain the thought of investing in your life is faith. And I've said it before, and I'll just um, say it again. Our concept of faith, especially people who are in the um, Pentecostal and charismatic movement, is skewed. What they call faith at best is hope, and hope is not faith. I say it again, hope is not faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of what? The things you hope for. Hope is an element of faith, but hope is not faith. You cannot continue to pray that, God, I need $2 billion. And you are praying, and you are fasting, and you are praying, and you are fasting. There are measures and measurements for these things. Number one, what do you have? What faith do you have that, because faith is a guarantee. Faith is an assurance. Most times when you have faith, you stop praying and you seek alignment. For many people, the reason why you are still praying over that thing is actually a sign that you're not in faith. And what is the other thing about faith? Two things. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. But faith is also based on relationships. You cannot, okay, don't let me use um, um, emphatic, um, absolute statement. The quality of faith you possess is also dependent on the quality of the relationship you have with God. The level of faith you have towards things, the level of result you have in life is fundamentally based on the level of relationship you have with God. And I, I posted a, I saw a video on TikTok today, which I shared on my Instagram, of a person who uh, people would come to him and tell them, tell him that they, he should pray for them so that they can hear the voice of God. And then he would lead them in a very short prayer and he would hang with a task. He says, if you really want to hear the voice of God, he now gives them a Bible and says, go and read this. This book will guarantee that you hear the voice of God. And then many of them will be shocked and say, ah, this is not what I'm thinking. And it says that that actually lets you know of their intentions, if they are really sincere about hearing the voice of God. A lot of us don't want to hear the voice of God. We just want to um, entertain a certain feeling of ego that God spoke to me. And you post it online that God spoke to me and said something. And so we need to understand that if you, if you really want to, hearing God is a dangerous thing. Because it's, it's, it will be unwise for you to hear from God and not obey God. It's better to disobey God because you did not hear God. It is worse to actually hear God and then disobey him. 
these are measures and measurements. Number one thing I said, what do you have? What is that token you have in your life that is a guarantee that you are moving in line with God, what God is saying? Number two, what have you been given? It's not the same thing. What you have is different from what you have been given. So I'll give you an example. Aliko Dangote, if he wants to maybe build a refinery, he has money. But most of the time, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not wise for a wealthy man to use all of his money to block an asset. He has to go to the bank and be give and request for something that would aid him to build. In life, you need to understand that you have something. There's nobody who comes to this earth that does not have what it takes for them to begin their journey into destiny and purpose, nobody. So if you are believing or confused about your life's choices, your life purpose of destiny, you're not looking in, or you are, you are, you are walking under a veil, or you are walking in darkness. Darkness, I think it's important to say this, darkness, the concept of darkness we have might be, we, we need to we throw it. Darkness is light, it's a kind of light, but it is not the true light. Let me put it in this way so that I don't use, darkness is a form of illumination. Darkness is a form of enlightenment. Darkness is a form of knowledge. Darkness is a form of experience, which is an experience that is not founded on the will and the purposes of God. It means that you might have an inspiration or an idea that when you practice that idea and execute it, you will become wealthy. But what furnished that idea to you is darkness. So even though you are wealthy, from God's perspective, you are walking in darkness. If God has a certain desire for you, I know that there are certain relationships, spiritual relationships, business relationship, marital relationship, destiny relationship, that would facilitate your alignment in God. And you don't pursue, sustain, or have those relationships, and it still feels like you are moving in the gift of the Spirit, you are walking in darkness. That's what it means. So being rich is not a sign. Let me, let me even blow our minds. You can hear from God, but the steps you take after hearing from God leads you into darkness. Why? Hearing God is one thing, is one step. Knowing what God wants you to do with what God has told you is another level of wisdom. For a lot of people, once they hear God, they believe that hearing justifies that they will march into destiny. No. What justifies that you march into destiny is wisdom, which is full of counsel, instructions, and precepts. So a lot of people are knowledgeable, but they are not wise. Knowledgeable gives you, knowledge gives you light, but wisdom gives you direction and alignment. So what do you have? What light do you have? What faith do you have? What resource do you have? What hope do you have? What idea do you have? What is, what is that thing that is driving your motivation? First thing. What have you been given? That means what source have you gone to to get reinforcement? So when Hadam and Eve experienced the, the old Kula Balu in the garden, when, they, when God came and says, Hadam, where are you? And says, I'm hiding, I'm ashamed um, because I'm naked. At that moment, what did God, as he said, who told you? That means you have been given something by someone that is not me. And so he said, who told you that you are naked? He said, did did any he have narrated the whole thing? A lot of us, even though we hear God, 
we are prophetic, we are apostolic, we are evangelical, and all and you see angels in your night, and all and you know the phone number of God. You might be walking in darkness because what has been given to you is not from God, even though it looks good, it looks great. Let me go on. So I've mentioned what do you have. I've mentioned what have you been given. The third thing is what do you need? See, um, every time you go to God in prayers, the prayer is actually supposed to be for what you need. When you go to God to pray for what you have or for what has been given to you, it's a sign that your relationship with God is faulty. Yeah. Now, what that means is prayer is supposed to be directional. God, I need counsel. God, I need direction. God, what should I do? What that means is that if the core of your prayers, um, let me put it this way. The way God works, you know that you don't really, God doesn't give people money. So it's a wrong prayer when you go to God and ask God for money. Because you already have money. You just need to tap into the revelation of who you are in Christ to know that you have money. Now, what God gives is wisdom. What God gives is ideas. What God gives is counsel and direction. So the best kind of prayers to pray when you are going to God is prayers for wisdom, for light, for direction, for counsel, for instruction. Why is that important? Because the response to those kind of prayers guarantees that you must position yourself in a, in a way or do certain things in line with what response God brings to you. So, what do you need? That's the third thing. The fourth thing is, now what do you want? You cannot ask for what you want. I, I know this might seem like semantics. If you don't have what you need. So, the pattern is, what do you have? What have you been given? What do you need? What do you want? If you go to God for a want, when you don't already, when you don't have a need yet, what you are going to God for is channeled by lust. Some people want money to satisfy lust, not because that money is going to be used in alignment with God's will. And so it's not surprising that you are not getting the kind of results in prayer you are getting because your intentions towards the response to those things is not to plug it back into the will of God. Measures and measurements. Now, important things in this season. Yahweh Savout is the revelation of the season. And that is because a lot of things will begin to happen that would begin to mimic the times of David. And one of the things that is going to happen is wars. The time of the earth is not the time of peace. The time of the earth is not the time of peace, it's the time of war. But in spite of what is happening, I don't know. I feel that certain times believers think that what is surprising to them is actually surprising to God. It's shocking. For a God who created things, who is unlimited by time and space, they actually think that what happens in 2023 or 2024 is going to be a surprise to him, that God is on his throne and then he just, ah, 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 hey, they are bombing Israel, they are bombing, oh, yeah, 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 like, what? Oh, nobody told me. That's not God. God is a master strategist that knows 
what the 10th generation from you will do is already playing before God. And so sometimes we need to go back to the center of God's will so that you can even pray the right prayers. It will be difficult for you to live a life of fear if you're in the center of God's will. Every time, of course, you can be afraid once in a while because we are humans. But if it is prolonged fear, it's a sign that you are outside God's will or you don't know what God's will is for that season. Because if you know what God's will is for that season, comfort will have come by the word of God. There, will, there is no way you will not get some comforting or reassuring words from God. Okay? So that's the first part. Um, the next thing I wanted to share is that one of the sub-themes of um, Judah's lion is houses, gates, and cities. And these are some of the things I got by revelation that we're supposed to build in the next season. As believers, you, you must be a builder in this season. Anything that does not revolve around building, building something. Because that is one of the requirements of the seasons in God. So the whole of your life, your work, your, your hobbies, whatever, must be building something, no matter how small that thing is. So are you building a house? One of the things the Lord showed me, I think from about three years ago, he was in layers. Three kinds of houses one should build in this season. By houses, they are metaphoric. They are not physical houses. We must build safe houses. We must build storehouses. We must build strong houses. So building a storehouse, I will not say too much about this. Just read the account of Joseph and how he preserve the generation. That is the economy of building a storehouse. Building a safe house talks about preservation of land, territories, and life and health, okay? And it's one of the reasons that I'm very happy of what, about one of the sessions we're having to know about believers and their health, which will really, really help us to understand some of the things we need to, to do. And then build a strong house. This is where a lot of believers fail. Because they, they believe God is a God of love. Okay? And so God must be inclusive. Oh, God is merciful. And so God does not punish sin. You need to understand that God is everything. And so building a strong house means that you must be combative. You, you can't be a nice guy. You can't be a gentle guy. You must be a warrior. Okay? It's very, very important. You cannot live your life unprepared. You cannot live according to the systems of this world. You must give yourself strict systems. As simple as what do you consume on social media? As simple as who do you follow on social media? As simple as, what do you dedicate more time to? As simple as, how long do you spend praying? By how long? I'm not talking about the length of the time, but I'm talking about the length of the communion you have with God. Some people can pray for 10 hours, and they only had communion for one hour. Some people can pray for five minutes, and they have communion for three days. So you must understand that it's not just you can finish praying, and then you are still basking in the presence. That means you have not stopped communion. So that's very important for us to do. So three houses, storehouse, safe house, and strong house. The next thing we have to think about building are gates. Gates talk about structures and systems that determine the approach and conditioning of cultures. Okay, so there's a cultural war around. We can all see it. Um, Attack is coming to the culture, attack is coming to the church, attack is coming to the family system, attack is coming to our concept of God and religion. All those things are gates. And so when the enemy goes through a gate, he disrupts certain ideologies and comes with his ideology. You know, when the Bible says that while men slept, the enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat. That system is actually the enemy breaking through a gate because the gatekeepers were not allowed, okay? So we need to begin to think about gates. And the final one is cities. So you, people are building houses, people are building gates. 
and people are building cities. Cities talk about economies, um, culture, and security at a national, community, or generational level. Those are cities. And so city, everything in a city, you find house, you find gates. So cities like the echelon of everything. That's very important. Now, one of the things I need you to begin to do is begin to ask God, God, what would you want me to build? What have you given me to build? Am I building a house? Am I building a gate? Am I building a city? You know, one of the things, and I would, because I would always use myself as an example to people so that it's something we can relate to. Um, many of the things that I do, it's not that I, I have all the resources or all the things to make it happen. But it's just that sense of, I feel this is what God is telling me. And then I go ahead to do it. I can make mistakes, I iterate and all of that. I remember when I started the, the Bible reading, Bible study thing, it was just like, okay, um, a lot of people would actually spend more time reading the Bible if there's a system of accountability to it and they develop a certain level of discipline. And so instead of, if I stood there and I said, God, I'm praying for your people, let them have the passion for scriptures, let them have the faithfulness of scriptures, that is religion. The way to answer that prayer is platforms. What can you do to bring people together for them to be faithful, accountable, and actually study the scriptures? And so it started like, okay, let me just do it. I'll just do it, I don't, just this month. You know, and I did it because usually most of these things is the things I get in my own personal time. And it, I always say, okay, God, um, could you want me to just do this personally or I can bring people along? If I get the okay now, oh, sure, you can, you can bring people along. Okay, yes. Then it becomes almost spontaneous. And so the Bible study thing started and, and people are like, oh, thank you. This is good, you know, and all of that. And it has continued month i don't think there's a month since like maybe march or so or april where we did not have take the bible study if we did it, it's probably because there's another program you know um that has happened um thank you for that and then the other one came which was a retreat and um so i'm currently on leave you know from at the office and then i said okay what can i do um, let me just spend that time. God. Okay, God, you know, I'm I'm beginning to plan what the next decade is going to look like, what next year is going to look like, getting blueprint. You know, it's okay. Um, do you know that you can actually bring people along you know, to do this? I oh, know that's going to cost a lot of money. I'm not ready for that. Did it da 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 and all of it. And then say, yes, you can actually do that. I say, okay, who will want to go for a retreat? You know, like retreats. People who are people do nine to five. People are already busy with too many things. You now want to put more things on their head again. It does not make sense. But it, it was compelling to me. And so the whole thing, once uh, it's 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 like a it's, it's a miraculous thing in its in its way. Because the day I decided that okay, God, that time that is dedicated for my leave. Let me use it as retreat and I will throw it open. In my mind, I was like, okay, maybe like maybe two people, five people will just join, you know, and I'll say that God, we could see. I know what to call people for you know, and all of that. But I was, I was surprised at the acceptance it got, you know, and how people wanted to be um, a part of it. And from there, in 24 hours, um, we created an Instagram page. Um, I once I started praying on the people I should invite so that I would not just be the only one to speak. Now, once I got the names of the people, um, then I I just reached out to them and I had grace. I did no one refuse me, but said, sure, no problem. Like, oh, wow, this is nice. And out of the blue, someone just said, Okay, I will do the flyer for you. <laughs> wow. You know, and the person just took the project, did the flyers, you know, we planned the page, we set up everything. I said, okay, what are we going to do? 
okay, we're going to do we use Instagram live, you know, we're going through the whole thinking about all, all within 24 to 48 hours, you know, and so yes, just came, okay, um, Instagram live, you know, really be so nice. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for that. Okay, WhatsApp, no, 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 WhatsApp, Zoom, okay, Zoom is good. Oh, I don't have Zoom paid version, you know, and it's just 40 minutes, that would be distracting. And I was just talking to someone, the person just said, pay for Zoom now. I've never paid for Zoom before because I don't think I have the need for it. And it's just for five days. Why would I pay for 30 days and all of that? Just pay for it, okay? I did that. So that lets you know that even though this is a God idea, something I'm doing for God, it, when we say God takes care of it, the way God takes care of it is he brings people, he makes sure that you have the money to subscribe for a Zoom paid version so that you'll be able to host this record online and all of those things. That is how it works. Now, the thing is, these are measures and measurements. But there will be people who God has given ideas, but they are still praying about the ideas instead of moving with the idea. And this is where a lot of believers are stuck. Some of you, you are still running with an idea God gave you five years ago, three years ago, and that idea has not grown beyond what it is. Do you know what that means? It means that if God, the merchant, comes to you, he will look at it as giving you a talent of five, and then he comes back to check it. You have not multiplied. That's what it means. Because God rewards faithfulness. I'm saying this because a lot of us, there's nobody here that would tell me that they have not gotten an idea that they believe that it was a God idea and they were willing to move with it but life happened. They did not meet the measurements. They did not meet the measure. For some people, the measure would be what? You have to spend nights praying concerning it. You have to fast concerning it. You have to worship God endlessly concerning it. Those are measures things you have to do in order to prove faithful with what God has committed into your hands. And so the core thing here is God wants us to build things. God has committed certain things in our hands, but the question is, what are you doing with it? My charge for us, because um, I believe that one of the grace factors for me is anything God tells me, and because I'm an independent person, I just go with it. I don't expect people to rally around. I just go doing it as if I would be the only one. And that thing has really helped. You know, and everything I've done so far, okay, the Bible reading, the praying communities, um, the retreats, which we are taking taking part in of it now, where all happened because I moved. And one of the things the Holy Spirit told me is that, do you realize that that Bible study things that you have done for a while is actually you building something? It may be a house, it may be a gate, it may be a city, but it's proof that you are building something. So as believers, we cannot say, oh, it's my temperament, I'm shy, oh, I don't have money, I don't have resources, nobody knows me, nobody likes me, nobody will be able to start something first and then begin to see how those things will actually go. There are lots of people who should have gone for additional education or go for certain courses. Um, some, some of you need to have your passports ready, you know, some of you need to travel somewhere, leave a certain location, move to a certain location on instructions to God. Because in the last days, these are the things that would help us to be victorious. Not the level of prayers we pray, but how aligned we are to the move of God, to the things of God, to the plans of God. Okay, so these are the things that I that are burning in my heart and I felt that it was necessary for me to share them um, with us this evening. So if we have, let me just pause there. If we have questions or comments, just let us do that in about 10 to 15 seconds. 
If there are no questions or comments, I will uh, go on to the conclusion and then we'll break bread and uh, call it a day. So do we have any questions? So you can either signify or use the chat section. I'm trying to check the chat sections now. Okay. Okay. All right, so in the absence of questions, so I want us to, I want us to pray in three minutes. And what that prayer should be, the focus of that prayer is God, help me to know what is your will for my life, the most important thing in this season. Open my eyes to see open my ears to hear, open my mind to understand and to comprehend what you have now. Because some of you have built a tabernacle in a place that God has moved away from. Because the seasons of God have moved past that. But because you are emotional with the things you've done, it becomes very difficult to leave that thing, leave where God has been, leave what God has said, and then move to where God is and to what God is saying. And so let us pray. But the Holy Spirit will, will, will bring that fire into our heart to let us know of a truth if we are in right standing with God with regards to his purpose and his will for our lives in this season. There are locations that mean that you're in the center of God's will. There are assignments, there are jobs, there are relationships, there are finances. There are things you need to do that would show as proof that you are actually living in God's plan for your life in this season. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you today. Holy Spirit, help us. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, guide us. We cannot do this on our own. We ask that you open our eyes to see. You give us your counsel and your light. We will not walk in the light that is darkness, but you give us the true light, which is the light of life. In the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the core things I also want to say, I, I, like I've mentioned, the emphasis of this season is spirituality, finance, and politics. What that means is that you must be a prince in these things. Spirituality, you don't joke about it. Finance, you don't joke about it. Politics, you don't joke about it. You must begin to influence people's ideas. You must have resources in men and in kind and in cash. Okay. Um, for some of you, let me let me um for some of you, you need to ask God for a kind of finance that you have not seen before, that you have not touched before. And the, the promise with that is that they are going to be used in something that has to do with God's center or God's will. The reason why many of us have not, are not asking for certain things is because we are, we are just going to use it on our lost anyway. But we need to come to a point where we become very serious. The world is not kidding. Agendas are going. Um, I always have a conversation with a friend, and we, we are worried about the, the next generation of children, the next generation of families, the kind of warfare parents are going to fight over the lives of children in this season because the seed of rebellion has been sown in these children. And so someone who is not even intentional about parenting, you, you are taking parenting by default, you think the best approach to parenting is the way your parents parented you when culture has changed, when times have changed, when seasons have changed. You need to understand that there, you must learn something. There is a way to do it in God. And in God doesn't just mean that you will sleep and you, the Holy Spirit, the angels will come and recite things to you. In God, it means sometimes you will have to register for a course on parenting, how to parent children of this age, how to be financially mindful. How to, how to speak the language of your children. These are things you have to be very intentional about. Remember, the final thing is um, in, in closing. What do you have in order to fulfill God's purpose for your life? 
What do you have? What have you been given? What do you need? And what do you want? You have to prayerfully have answers to these questions so that they will be the guiding light you know, for um, your next phase and your next part in this thing. All right, so I want us to um, take our elements of communion if we have them the same at this time. Um, it's an instruction we're giving that every day of the retreat we preach. Always take communion. So even for me, I don't have bread. I'm using pure bliss. So you can have anything for your element of communion. You can have bread, cookies, anything. All right, for those of us who have it, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has come to us today. We receive this. You said in your word that the bread represents your body. And so by taking and sharing this, we declare that we are, we share the body of Christ. We are one with Christ. That which is the inheritance of Christ is ours. That which is allotted to Christ is ours. The life, the victory, the reign, the priesthood, everything that is in Christ is in us. Because we share the same body. We are married to Christ and we become one flesh with him. As he is one with God, we are one with Christ and we demonstrate his identity upon this for the glory and the honor of his name. So we can break the bread. And then we take our elements which signifies the blood. It can be water, it can be juice, wine, whatever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are representations of the blood. You said to us in the scriptures that the waters represent your blood. And so we partake of the blood of Christ today. We share the same blood with you. We receive a divine transfusion. So everything that is not allowed in Christ is not allowed in us. Sickness is not allowed. Disease is not allowed. Death is not allowed. Addictions are not allowed. Everything that is not permitted in Christ is not permitted in us. Because we share the blood of Christ. The blood that flows through Christ by reason of this communion flows through us. So we are yanked away from the old man. We continue to take on the new man in Christ Jesus that all the glory and the honor may be to him in Jesus' name. So we can take. Now, the beautiful thing about these things is that <clears throat> you might think it's just physical things that we're doing. But because we're doing it by instruction, there's a way he has propensity to permeate the soul realm and the spiritual realm. And that's why instructions are are very important. And so remember, one of the things that we should begin to seek God for today is prayerfully, what do you have? What have you been given? What do you need? And what do you need? All right? So God bless us. Um, I also need to stress that um, if there are so that the, the group is not just quiet and all, if you have certain questions or certain things you feel the need to share, you can also share that um, within the group so that everyone can um, benefit from it. Right? So God bless us all and um, let us have a very good so ending.